<laughs> Good morning, Heather. How Good are you morning, today? Cindy Michelle. I'm doing absolutely fine. I think you've probably you've already done an hour of this, so <laughs> you going. that's okay. I'm not doing a I'm not doing a blabathon. I promise. It's uh, I, I'm just so happy to use this as a medium to actually get to chat to interesting people like yourself and uh, get some good content for some of my um, readers and people on our website. So thank you for joining me today and talking about the topic choosing and marketing yourself to a niche. So I'm just going to tell a little bird and if anybody else would like to tell a bird about that too, that's great. So first of all, tell me, background, just brief history and bring us up to speed with why this topic and where we got to. <laughs> I don't know whether there's a brief history of it, but I'll try and be brief. So in 2009, I had uh, had one of those career defining moments where I discovered that I had 90 days to find out what I would be doing in my life as I wouldn't be working at an accountancy firm anymore. Um, so I thought, well, I've always wanted to set up my own business as an executive coach. I've been almost for 10 years now in learning and development uh, with a tiny bit of redundancy money behind me. Now it's as good as time as any. Or shall we say now is the worst time you can do this, but you have no other options, which is the other way of looking at it. <laughs> um, so very, very simply, because my kids were well, well, at that point, they were one and just about to turn three at the time uh, when I got the 90 days notice. Um, <clears throat> you know, I had very little capital. I didn't have, you know, two years worth of savings. Uh, my network had been decimated by two maternity leaves. So it really was it was. Um, you know, how do I get my name out there? How do I actually um, do this in a way that that works? Because I don't have time to to muck about as I do need to put food on the family table. You know, the, the six months of savings will only last so long. Um, and so I really fell into social media, um, sort of Twitter, mainly at the time. And that led to me generating a huge amount of coaching work uh through twitter and everybody was like how do you do that how do you do that um and so it was at that point i stepped back and thought well how do i do that i was then off the back of that asked to write the guide uh the book the financial times guide to business networking which came out in 2011 uh summer 2011 and sold two and a half thousand copies overnight um but something was bugging me um because i didn't think that networking uh, was the whole answer um, and, and why was it that some people almost without a network were seemingly able to do amazing things and I got slightly diverted at that point and wrote the book uh, how to make partner and still have a life because I'd always wanted to write it as you do um, and it was really hard to write that book and and it occurred to me sort of halfway through that I'd done something really stupid by writing that book. But since I'd been commissioned, I had a co-author, I had commitments that I needed to keep. Um, I'd gone away from building a brand into another brand because career, career management and uh, referral generation really don't mix in a professional services firm. You know, marketing doesn't talk to learning and development. Oh, no, we don't do that. <laughs> um, and so I kind of thought, well, what is it that, I really love what's what is the trend here what's the common element and actually what I really loved was helping people become a go-to expert and we had one of those happy accidents in life where we would sort of built this program called the go-to expert and people were signing up for it and we we're like oh there must be something in this you know where you're like the universe is telling me something here so so that was where I sort of that was where the whole idea of the go-to expert came is how it was how do you sort of bridge the gap between networking and all the rest of the stuff you do mm -hmm. to really make yourself fly by differentiating yourself, building your profile? Because pre-social media, that, that used to be a hard slog. You know, it was pacing the streets. It was getting yourself out there. It was being best friends with editors. And I, in many, for many respects, shortcut my journey and I saw our clients shortcutting their journey to do that. And that's really where the go-to expert came. It was, how do you, first of all, choose your niche and market yourself to your niche on the basis, this isn't a book that's written for um, what I would call very good marketing people. It's written for a <laughs> book that are people that accidentally find themselves needing to market themselves, whether of course it's a speaker, whether it's somebody that's um, you know, gone freelance, or whether it's somebody that's maybe in a firm that's needing to build a uh, 
build a client portfolio. And what it does is it is in very, very simple, non-technical jargon, gives you a roadmap of step by step, absolutely what you've got to do. And for anybody that's read in my books, they'll know that there's no, there's no, there's no kind of high level and do this. It's real. This is exactly what you need to do. And um, that's where it all came about. Okay. So I know there's a lot of people that um, think that they're not in a niche market. And then you've got the other kind, which is they realize that um, they've got to get niche. So, for example, a motivational speaker or a person who thinks they're a motivational, they think that they can talk to anybody. But then you will get another motiv another motivational speaker who thinks and realizes actually they need to talk to one particular sector. How can you make somebody jump from one kind of mindset that they do need to kind of specialize when their information is specialist when they're not in that mind frame? The simple thing is if if you are a speaker that's already earning the three grand plus per appearance fees and your diary is full and you're in demand and you can pick and choose. You don't need to be niche because your brand is strong enough to do what you're doing. You've got enough links. You've got enough kudos. You've got enough awareness. You've got enough a track record. You are the big fish already swimming in the pond, mm -hmm. whereas a lot of people starting out aren't in that position. Um, and the challenge is when it's only you or actually what you've got to do as well is you've got to be able to maybe speaking is only part of your revenue stream you've actually got to do some client work you've got to run your business you've got to do this you've got to do that you've got family you've got da, 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 da. and then and so on and so on so this is all about really thinking quite effectively um and and how do you make your marketing really stand out uh because that's what my audience is typically faced with how do i do this business development thingy majiggy which i don't feel comfortable with in a way that i do feel authentic and a way that really works and if you've, if you've got very little time, the worst thing that you can do is try and be all things to everyone. So that motivational speaker who goes, as long as they've got a pulse, so I can motivate them to achieve their dreams. That's going to be a hard sell um, because let's remember that at this stage, a lot of event managers are looking for the expert that their budget will allow them to afford. Let's be pragmatic about this new speakers particularly if they're motivational think they've got a, a message that's suitable for everyone you know as long as you've got a pulse i can inspire you and motivate you to change your life and what i was actually saying was that um, a lot of event managers don't just want anyone they want the expert that their that their budget can afford mm -hmm. and so very much when you've got limited marketing time when you've got limited budget what you've got to try and do is you've got to try and become visible uh you've got to be try and become the fish in the smallest pond possible that will pay for your time and money um and so it's worth it's worth looking at it maybe a sector a demographic and really thinking about right if i'm going to become the speaker for something let's start small rather than big it is that when you when you're starting out uh, if you want to get the quickest start you can, the best thing to do be is try and be a big fish in a small pond. But the real challenge is finding out what pond you need to be in. Yeah. And to use uh, that analogy. And far too often, people go with their guts. Um, you know, you think about it. If you, were, if you were opening a retail business or a shop, you do your market research beforehand. So the real question is, you know, why, why do particularly say speakers and professionals think they know it all and they don't do their research. You know, we think we do, don't we? We think, oh yeah, there's a market for this and we don't actually go and check. And always the first stage, my view is to go and do some research. Um, well, at least find out who your competition is because <laughs> yeah. if, if the market's flooded for experts in X, then maybe you don't want to be the next expert in X. Yeah. You want to find, find something else to talk about. And, and actually, you know, there's, it's actually fine having some competitors out there talking about similar things because it demonstrates that there's a marketplace. Well, the, the very fact that you're a niche, yeah, the very fact that you're a niche means that quite often um, you've actually got to go out there and garner your own market. Yeah, um, it's true. Sometimes you have to actually build your own tribe. Yeah, you know, because um, if it's a niche, just its very definition means that it's not very well known. Um, no, I, it, it's interesting. Um, I, I take your point. I was having a 
conversation on LinkedIn with a business coach that will remain nameless, who was being controversial. Um, and it was a good job he was virtual. Um, who was going, I can't see the point of this niche thing. And my view of a niche is actually, it's where you choose to specialize in something that the whole marketplace doesn't. Uh, and it enables you to stand out. So at one level, it could be, um, let's, let's take an example. So let's take, let's take lawyers, uh, which is a good example. So 30 years back when Elaine Aaron started practicing, it was niched then to become an employment lawyer. That was quite, you know, avant-garde. It was out there. It was really different. And that was, that was her niche. And so she's always been known as an employment lawyer. And at that time, it was very much niche because people, she was the first specialist employment lawyer. Whereas now, employment lawyers to a penny. So you've got to go one level deeper than that very much to write. Is it a technical skill that you've got as an employment lawyer? Is it a, um, or is it actually a sector that you work with? And I think the important thing here is to, to it's not about the concept of you have to be tiny, tiny in what you focus on, but you've got to be one or two levels deeper than what the herd are doing. But it, it comes back to, it comes back to a lot of people make mis the mistake of either thinking that they're not niche enough or going too niche. And I think that's, that's the real problem that people make. It's got to be just niche enough. So, you know, when I started, I very much started around business networking, social media, referral generation for the profession. So lawyers, accountants, uh, that type of thing. And I used to do a lot of my time and crafting my trade as a speaker, speaking to accountancy institute groups. You know, there, there isn't much that I can't say about networking to a SEMA group. And I've got one of those coming up in a week's time, which will be lovely. Um, but then, then my brand diversified a bit. I got a little bit better known and I was able to speak on a wider sector. And I think it's all about when you start is the really important thing is dominate that small pond, craft yourself as a speaker. And then as your profile grows and as people get to know you and know that you're good, that's then your opportunity to, um, to, to go a little bit wider. So almost fast forward now four years four and a half years from me starting speaking to and doing a lot of SEMA gigs I was headlining um headlining the accounting web practice excellence conference and the first thing I was speaking about was the psyche of the non-traditional accountant which was way out of my comfort zone but it was <laughs> something that as I'd worked with accountants in practice for now it's getting on for 10 years which is a bit worrying <laughs> I sort of probably probably knew I had something to say on it and then and then I was doing something in the afternoon on, on you know what what do the clients of the future want so as you can see my marketplace has stayed very very static but what I'm known for is diversified a little into more general practice management strategic business growth and so you could see that over time your niche can grow and it can grow both on a sector expertise or it can grow on a subject expertise but it's all about where you start because it's all about the hardest bit is not to get your 20th gig it's to get your first five gigs and mm. then it's to get your first five paid gigs um and if you're going to take that that first step in and that initial bit forward the important thing is to really i suppose it's it's three tests you know, three tests that I kind of use with people. The first one is, um, are you passionate about it? Because Number if you're going to write absolutely. about it, if you're going to speak about it, if you're going to podcast, if you're going to video, you if you're going to have a conversation with random lovely people in Australia, you know, are you passionate about it to keep the force of your charisma going? Um, so that, that that's one of the things is because you've got to love it. I mean, I, I take one of my clients who's an accountant, Phil, and he's now he's now one of the movers and shakers in the world of independent retailers and accountants in practice. And and if you cut him open, he bleeds independent retail. You know, he, he's a man and he goes shopping for pleasure. He's a, he's got a wife and kids as well. You know, it's you know. He, <laughs> That's just weird behaviour. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is the point that Ian is man. making on the side because he's he made a 
co good comment earlier, which uh, if you scroll up, you might find it. But he said, at least niching gives you a chance to hone your skills with an audience. You can prime, um, prime, yeah. specific, prime specifically. Get that working. You've got success testimonials and proof. And I think that is a very good um, footprint for any speaker to actually have on, a, on the Internet, would you not say? Yeah. Absolutely. And the second test that you need to do is credibility. <laughs> so um, uh, this is a completely stupid example, but I'm five foot two. So if I started speaking about the challenges of being, you know, really tall, I just wouldn't be credible. And I know that's a completely farcical example, but I just wouldn't be credible. Um, you know, I actually it changed, is a challenge. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I actually changed. I actually changed my business brand in about 2011 because I went by the name of the efficiency coach. And I have to say, I'm one of the most inefficient people that goes and I, I felt really uncomfortable about being that brand I didn't have that credibility so it, it's important that those first two that you're passionate and that you're credible of course well, you've got to walk the talk don't you, you yeah and I think I think you can I think you can build that credibility as you go but I think it's important that if you want to speak on it you do need that credibility so it is about um you know I've I did you know I built the credibility as a, as a referral expert by blogging on it, doing it, working at it, experimenting with it, interviewing 30, 30 top thought leaders on interview, on networking, either people that were the Ivan and Mizens of the world or, or they were the, the Andy Lapartas or, were, or they were the people that were just doing it in their day-to-day -day role, either inside or external. And somebody that said, Cindy, your guest is excellent. I love you, Alerts, Nick. And I will talk forever. So thank you very much for that <laughs> wonderful compliment. Uh, so it is about, you know, you can build that credibility. But I think if you're then going to speak, you've got to have, you, you can't just suddenly rock up on, on day one and go, right, let's pluck a subject out of the air. Let's read all the books about it and then speak on it. Because you won't have your take on it, your angle on it, because that's what makes a real difference as a speaker. They don't want people to regurgitate the same old, same old. They want people that can bring a new angle, uh, something that's different to it. And I know that, um, you know, I'm, I'm speaking in a, a very crowded marketplace. There's a lot of people that speak about business development, practice management to the professions. But part of the reason that I'm getting, getting, the, getting the work coming my way is, frankly, because, as the phrase goes, I'm not pale, male and stale. You know, I'm not 50 plus. I'm not white. Well, I am white, but, but I'm not male. I bring something different. Man, um, I'm, you just fired me. I, I took a lot of <laughs> Well, that's... Sorry. Yep. How do you... Uh, can I interject? How do you actually get the credibility to start off with? That's that's the thing where uh, where I've like basically come into it. I'm like, that's all great. And you've got... <laughs> and you've got there even though you're three foot high. Um, but and that's, that's fantastic. But how, like my, my take on this is like, how do you actually like get credible to start off with? So the way I'd yeah. like to just proffer some of the, uh, the, the ways that I did it. So anyone that's listening is just going, yeah, well, that's great. But how did you actually get there? So the way, the easiest way to like growth hack it is to just uh, hang off the coattails of somebody else in your industry. So what happens is there'll always be some guru, there'll always be some sort of like, you know, people that i don't know that everyone <laughs> seems to go go wide and kind of like oh my god yeah, i want us. to be that person <laughs> and you just go yeah all right fair enough so oh my god and when you scratch away the surface usually they're sort of like a bunch of bell ends but anyway so the way to uh, to basically get around this is to um do interviews all right so the best way i can recommend to anyone that's listening at the moment is to start doing some interviews all right. Uh, start doing some blabs if need be. I actually think that blabs a bit of a pain <laughs> in the ass and it's a bit too like shiny, shiny. OK, so my take on it is to try it seriously, is to try and do something like, dare uh, I say, uh, is to try and do like a Google. Uh, Hangout. There I couldn't one, do right? Google. That's why I'm here. <laughs> yeah, I know. Nah. Well, I know. Right, don't even get me. <laughs> Don't even get me started, right? But <clears throat> there's a method in my madness, all right? So just, just listen to what I've got to say because, like, this stuff, like, will get you banked really, really quickly, all right? And it will take about three months from literally from zero to hero to get in your paid gigs. So <clears throat> I know because I've done this. So the way of doing it is to basically get on, do your blabs, do your Google Hangouts, interview the people that are, like, you know, like, bright-eyed and doughy-eyed. Get, um, get them. They always love talking about themselves. So basically ask them a load of questions, 
uh, steer the conversation, maybe a promoter as well. Get a load of like the people that know that name in the industry to like tune in and listen to your interviews of these like of these gurus. Save those um, things, upload them into YouTube, do what you need to do. Connect. This is really important. Connect all of your <laughs> AdWords. What's AdWords? Google it. You need to connect your AdWords video remarketing lists to those particular um, uh, videos. All right, which basically means then the uh, the if, if anyone actually watches any one of those videos, because you'll create a playlist. Okay, so let's say for argument's sake, you spend a solid one month right of just doing say three interviews per week with all these gurus well now you've got like a fantastic playlist of like youtube videos that you can actually add and say add words yes if anyone watches this playlist any one of the videos on this playlist could you actually serve them out some more video adverts and yeah of course i can do that but what happens is you get all and you plug into all of their um, followers and you plug in and you get seen to be the authority and the expert because you're hanging off their coattails Right. So what you then do is you still maintain your course of being um, credible. OK, you need to know your stuff, obviously, but you get seen and your individual traits can then start to come through. But you can start selling yourself and promoting yourself by, oh, that Famous guy that interviewed such and such. Oh, okay. That's the way it will start. And then obviously you'll start getting a name for yourself. Boom, there you go, brand association. It's a really good well, growth hack. And that bring, hope, yeah, sorry. well, that hope brings very nicely into the story. question that E French Cafe um, asked uh, quite a while ago, which is, what's the itty gritty? Um, what's the itty gritty of one identifying and then two following your niche? So it's all very well again coming down to what you've just said, but we've still got to do that first step, first step before we get there. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Well. well which is to find the identifiers. Actually, if, to, if I always the, carry uh, the on, so you've got step, the three tests because French Cafe is really looking, E-French Cafe is really looking forward to my third point, <laughs> which is the, um, you know, it, it's passion, credibility, and you're absolutely right. Sorry, I don't know your first name, Australia, well, but... Um, <laughs> wow. It's Australia. <laughs> but, it's but Australia. Bur but burrowing authority, burrowing authority <laughs> is actually a great way of quickly getting there. But the, the third thing is about fit, what do I mean by fit? It's about, is there a marketplace that will pay the level of fees you want in the business model you want? Because I could become really passionate about helping unemployed women get back into the workplace. Um, but my kind of hourly rates tend to sort of start with a three, 300 pounds. There's not a fit there, is there, between, um, between, between what unemployed women can afford even government grants can afford, you know, there just isn't a fit for that. So, uh, and you look at that sort of, that sort of speaking thing is about, you know, really scraping around for when, it, where's there a grant, where's there a project? <laughs> so, so it is really about looking to see, is there a fit, a really good fit between, is there a market that will, that you really like being in that will, that will pay you the right sort of money to do what you want to do? Have you got passion for it and have you got credibility? And I think as a speaker, if you step out on that stage, if you think about it, whether it's whether it's virtual, whether it's physical, the first thing you do, what you've hopefully done before, is in your introduction of given the why should you listen to me? And and as Australia Well says, if actually if you're a little short of ideas, read all the books uh, and then get very good at persuading great people to come on to a podcast show and and it doesn't matter whether it's a podcast show, it doesn't matter whether it's a blog, but I think, and I can't remember who said it, and, and I didn't like it in the first place, but if it's, if it's all about getting instant quick credibility, you've got to dominate one medium, whether that's YouTube, whether it's Blab, whether it's Twitter, whether it's, whether it's a blog. Um, you know, the key thing here is that you pick one that you know your audience is there and, and you go for it. Um, you know, in my early days, I dominated Twitter. You know, I, it was Twitter in a blog, and and I still am living off that Twitter in the blog for a long time. And and Australia, wow, you're being great. You're giving lots I'd of thumbs up. I love to know how he does and that. Welcome back, Paul. Hello. <laughs> Can I just make a very quick point, and then I'll jump out and let anyone else uh, jump in because I, I found very interesting what uh, Australia had to say, and um, it, you know, and a lot of that uh, resonates with me. But one way not to get credibility or one way to really uh, 
ruin your credibility is, and we're using that technology, Google Hangouts on air. I, I, I've used Google Hangouts for uh, for many, well, I wouldn't say many years, but certainly 17 months, 18 months. And it's a pig's ass to get your head around. <laughs> yeah. the, the UI, the UI is dreadful. And I had to, and I use this, I use that technology now extensively uh, for my business and, and for some of my clients. And um, even now, after using the platform for 18 months, um, it still has its quirks, it's full of bugs, um, and it's just not easy to use. Not just not just as the uh, facilitator of a, a, a Hangout, but it, as if I wanted to bring in Heather, for example, to do an interview, She's gonna, especially if she's not been on it before. Unlike Blab, she's gonna, she's gonna struggle. Um, and that is, if you've got people that, you, so if you, so what the point I'm trying to make is, is, if you've scheduled a show for people to watch as a as a way to raise your your brand awareness, brand perception, credibility, whatever it may be, um, and it falls on its ass at the first hurdle, your credibility is gonna go down the toilet. So my advice is, yes, use the technology to uh, raise your credibility, but make sure you understand it before you apply it professionally. Yeah, and, and you've got a really good point there, Paul. It comes back to that credibility thing in terms of marketing to a niche. So, um, you know, particularly as I was doing my, you know, I work with the professionals, you know, I'm wearing a shirt today. I've got a nice smart Don't jumper on. I'm not going to stand up and credibility. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm not going to show you that I've got jeans on because I knew that I'd just be headshot. You know, I've actually deliberately put these in the background so that you can see them. Famous um, plug. I would have never have guessed that. <laughs> this, then people start to recognise the symbol of my face because I've got another. I've got another take on that, Heather. And while I don't, yes. I, while I don't think that that's a bad thing, what you're doing, and it's, it obviously works for you, I actually take completely the opposite approach because. I've got a client meeting, which is a pitch actually. A pitch <laughs> about what time is it now? About half one. I'm going to. They're actually an existing client, but they want me to do something new for them. Yep. Um, and you can see the way I'm dressed now. <laughs> yep. And I've got yep. jeans on underneath here. Right? I've yep. got either shave. Okay. And now I won't be getting changed to go to this meeting. You won't be. Right. Now, all right, maybe it's that I already have credibility but to, with this client because they're an existing client. Mm. But actually, the original meeting that I went with to them, I didn't get, I didn't make any effort either. And the, and perhaps that might be in my area of expertise. I'm already quite well known, and I suppose I don't have to. And the, the fact that I'm very relaxed about it and what you see is what you get is actually the appeal sometimes. And and you 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 you've actually almost backed up what I'm saying here. It's about actually looking like you fit in in your audience. Yeah. And if you're already that big fish in the big pond and you already got the work and the name and the brand, you can break a hell of a lot of the rules and get away with it. Um, you know, for me, because I'm wanting to present myself, hopefully as towards the top end of speakers rather than the, hey, I'm aspiring and I wanna get out and do some <laughs> speaking and how do I get my first gig type speaker? Because I'm wanting to present myself at the top end you know, I thought very carefully about the background. So we've got we've got the books. We've got the fact that I'm actually put a bit of makeup on today. Um, you know, minor things rather than just rocking up in a you know big cuddly jumper. Actually, the cuddly jumper sitting behind me, but we don't need to know that. Um, but it is it is about, and it's not just about when people meet you physically. It's about when people meet you virtually as well, uh, because what so many people forget as a speaker is that your speaker buyers are often 80 to 90% through their buying process before they make contact with you. And people people are still think it's back in that old world of, um, you know, you took the inquiry, you converted from the inquiry. Actually, if you get your inbound marketing right, if you get your online profile right, if you get your differentiation right, uh, you'll get warm prospects who are hot to trot and ready to buy, and it's just a matter of making sure there really is mm. a fit. 
that's um, all part of your sales so strategy as well though really which is just basic yeah. business and marketing and marketing analysis it's determining your personal yes. brand isn't it that you've actually determined that this yeah. is how you want to be perceived yeah. you've got that first chance to make a good impression and this is the impression yeah. you want to make and everybody kind of determines that in their own way hopefully um oh, but well, hopefully yeah. it is crafted and thought about that it is something that people um you put it out there to be perceived your audience. in the right way. Unless you're a college student, I'm glad going like that. And then yeah. that's a different kind of yeah. lab someone's said, someone's said in the audience there, um, dress for your audience. And that's that's absolutely right. And the thing is, is I would imagine the type of people have uh, not knowing anything about your business. So um, I'm just uh, making assumptions here. But uh, I suspect you're going, to, you're trying to um, speak to high-end corporate organizations and they ain't going to book someone like me to talk to their staff uh, um you know but i'm not a public i'm not a speaker you know and you do sure. have to there are certain, lord uh, sugar or whatever his name is he's got that corner yeah and, but lord sugar's <laughs> but he's not actually yeah, great at but, speaking but, um if you're gonna have, no but he's if got you're a talking brand. about a, he's got yeah, a presence he's got that but not not as a nice cuddly soft boss either but people oh, are actually wanting point. this information. Now, I think Steve made a very good point earlier, and I've known some speakers who've done this, which um, he gives uh, free talks to the MBA students at international universities, which helps him build excellent credibility and professors speak to each other and he gets refer, um, referred to speak at other locations. I've known speakers who have actually niched into the colleges and the universities because and specific programs because they then will um, go into job roles and places and actually bring into the corporates a little bit later on. So yeah. it, it is all part of your strategy and then having that backup, pretty much what you were saying, Heather, making sure that your online mm. profile and everything else and your credibility is there, which then goes back to what Australia Wear was saying. So it's sort of like it's a little <laughs> bit of everything you need to do. There is, there's there's yeah. no, no one size fits all, is there, with this sort of stuff? No, no. And, and you're absolutely right, Paul. My audience tends to be accountants, lawyers, uh, consultants. It tends to be the that sort of everything big four magic circle right down to the small firms um yeah at the, you know the hardest dilemmas is when i'm turning up to speak an accountancy conference where i know most of the delegates are going to be in jeans yeah. it's actually how far do i go towards the casual side side of smart casual? <laughs> you can be smart casual you can be smart casual i i i try to do that to be fair especially if i'm going to a, a new pitch so i refuse yeah. i ref i only wear a suit on one type of occasion i'm a local authority councillor i'm a elected member at our local council and because i'm representing a large number of local residents i think it's only right that i show them respect by turning up to council meetings in a suit but that is the only time uh, and civic functions uh, but that is it the only time i will wear a suit now i'll go to pitches i, I went to a pitch uh, last year to, for my now my biggest <coughs> very large print media company national print media company um but what i did was so instead of wearing a suit i just wear a jacket with a shirt with no tie and a pair of jeans and a smart pair of sneakers and that that's it um you yeah, know I'm, but your media your media you're expected to sort of you know smart for you is a black polar neck and remembering to have a shave that morning <laughs> you know or shaping the goatee so it's just right you know it's it's it, it's very different i think it's a different market yeah yeah, if we if if we kind of almost take the sort of takeouts from this conversation, that if it's about marketing and fight and marketing to a niche, it really starts by kind of understanding what they expect for, see so that you fit in, so that you feel a part of them. Um, it is about what you need to do to be seen credible, <coughs> you know. And I've got everything from the bespoke jacket and suit that I do for you know, if it's Magic Circle Big Four, that's what I'm dressed in right down to I know that I've got a consultancy client that Where's dresses that? down in the office. So I don't do, unless I'm going somewhere else afterwards, I do that. But it comes back to, so it comes back to, you know, those three things. It's about passion, fit and credibility. But a lot of people think they know the answers to all of that. And actually, I, I say to people, you don't. And actually, what you've got to do is go and get out and talk to your audience. 
And the trouble is if you're trying to get speaker bookings is actually knowing who is the right person to talk to. Because I, if I think about the easiest industry for me to proactively instead of just wait for the speaker bookings to come to me to go after, it would be the six big software providers for um, accountants. It would be the networks. And then it would be looking at uh, seeing if I could get in to do some of the very high paid corporate work for the big firms speaking at their big annual conferences partner conferences so already I kind of know where the right people are to get the sort of three four five grand bookings um, but if you don't know the industry well enough or you don't know what you're going after you've got to answer that question first so it's worthwhile going out and actually speaking to speakers that are already there but what you've you've got got to I was going to say, but that also you've comes back down to, first. sorry. So you've got to determine that what you're going to be able to um, give people is information that has value for them. So That's and, what I was just about look, to say. Look, I know yeah. that that takes baby steps, but um, really until you've kind of packaged that thing that you're going to sell, um, I'm not sure that you, you know, there's no point selling it until you've got the, the product there to sell. Yeah, And I, I think that's the big thing that I find on this side and also with working with um, clients and being a client um, in the past. You can have all your three steps that you've had, but if you've got no content to back that up and you cannot see the yeah. value or the depth of your information before I actually meet you, then I am not going to be amused if you then start asking me <laughs> for a big fee. So no, <laughs> I've got to feel that I, value I think... before I actually meet you. And that's why yeah. this platform and what you're doing here is so clever. Uh, sorry, what was your name again? Oh, no. Cindy. 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 <laughs> that's why, sorry, I'm, so, I'm terrible with names. That's why um, what you're doing here is so clever and, and so compelling. I love coming in on your labs just to listen to the, the, the broad range of, I mean, Heather is a, is a speaker, um, you know, obviously a, either a contemporary uh, even, possibly even a, um, a, a a competitor, but you know you complement each each other, and it's all really useful content that you can put now put on your YouTube channel or on your Facebook page or wherever. Um, and if somebody's thinking of, of booking you, at least they get to see you before you even you even before you even go into a boardroom and try and present to the why you should work for them. If, I think if they've seen you on this before round. I think they probably have made the decision anyway. <laughs> and I think, I think, you know, the, the, the content bit is really important because what we've got here is we've got a lot of uh, speakers wanting to make a fast start. And, and I know Cindy and I have talked about this before. There is no such thing as a real fast, fast start as a speaker. You've got to build your authority. You've got to do your time. And if anything, the professional speaking is the last bit of the mm, revenue absolutely. stream that you add on top. And it is about, you've got the combination of, have, as you say, having to build your authority and demonstrating your knowledge in depth. And, you know, I think about it, just one of my blogs, How to Make Partner, has got over 500 articles. I've been blogging there since two, uh, since sort of April, May 2012. You know, it, it's probably now one of the global sites for career progression in, the in you know, prof uh, professional services firms mm. and, and you look at it like that there's two books on that you've got the range and depth of content there um, and then it's now then about adding the speaking on top of that but but uh, often people either miss out two steps they either do the sales approach which is let me find out what the prospects are go and speak to them find out what they want then deliver that or they go and so they then miss out the build the body of authority or they build the body of authority and and do what I do, which, you know, I'll put my hands up, is that I'm lazy and I wait for the speaking opportunities <laughs> to come my way. Um, and I think if you, if you want that really fast start as a speaker, you've got to do both. You've got to really have built the authority. But you see, that and that's the difference. Is there's two ways of doing speaking. You can either have a, a business, a day job, is, is kind of my way of calling it, where you're actually engaged in doing what you're trying to do. And then you're using speaking to either highlight that and use it as an extreme form of marketing, which means it should be part of your strategy and it comes in. You then get the professional where all their income is derived from speaking 
And on the back of the speaking is when they'll sell their um, backup CD, their backup product and their backup training to follow up on their actual speaking so they get more speaking. Yeah. Um, they're the ones who, yes, you really got to pick the niche, build the content, the credibility, the value and everything else. Whereas the other way around, you've got to put the content around the business and what you're trying to do and the service first so that the speech enhances that. And I think that's where I find people get misaligned and then lose the value. And then you tend to find that the person who is speaking on behalf of the company then gets offered a bigger paycheck elsewhere because actually they're not in line with what you're trying to do as a business either. Well, I think to quote like our American friends who seem to kind of get this formula right in that you've got to have a product and so they get their product which is mostly a book or a, is is something that they can then wrap around their their brand so then they've got something to talk about they've got something to sell and they've got something to be and that, that's often represented in the product in the in the in the book or whatever it is that they're, they're sort of aligning themselves with and that that's then defines their niche, I think, Heather, is that when once you've got that kind of book or that that thing, you've defined yourself, here I am, this is me as, as the, the written version of what I might talk about. So Yeah. It it it, it it's really interesting. One of the best ways when you've got a book to market yourself as a speaker is as soon as you get an inquiry to pop a book <laughs> into the post to them. Yeah. Um and it becomes even easier. <laughs> Absolutely. It becomes even easier. So I've got three traditionally published books and I've got one um, and one book that I've recently done self-published. But I made sure that the production values of the self-published book was as high as the right. published books. It makes it a lot easier to put a £2.50 book in the post than a book that's going to cost you £10 to buy mm. yourself. But it, it's all about that risk and return. But wouldn't it be great if you could um, not only send them a book, but you could also send them a link it by email to one of these that you've appeared on? If it, if, uh, if, yes. the, if the recording yeah. is, you know, if it's if it fits what you're trying to do, and maybe you could contrive yeah. that yourself. You know, you've got a good friend here. Absolutely. Who, who, the more. Yeah. You, you're absolutely right. The more marketing assets that you've got that are aligned to your niche that when you get that inquiry that you can go, brilliant, love to speak to you. Before that we speak, um, just popping a book in the post. Um, here's a link to download the PDF of it. Here's a link to my show reel. Here's a link to a couple of clips that I did at a similar type <laughs> audience talking on a similar Absolutely. Type subject. It all calls together. If you, sent me a book, <laughs> if you sent me a book, Heather, I would. Yep. I'd, I'd probably tell you I'd, I'd dipped in and out of it, but the truth <laughs> would on be the shelf behind. <laughs> I would read the back cover, and that would be it. Um, and they don't need to read it. They no, actually no, they don't, don't need. It to adds read. credibility to what you're doing. Mm. But yeah. what they are more likely to do, and I think would probably give you more value if it was right, uh, is either a podcast or a, uh, or one of these to listen to or watch. What? Um, the more likely to do that in the car on the way to work or on the way home mm. or on the toilet or on the lunch break Brilliant, or yeah. whatever it may be than, than to actually sit down and read a book. And they'd get more from it if you kept it short enough. It you, really depends on, again, it depends on the audience, I will say. Yeah. Um, um, so, for example... It, the book becomes yeah. your bricks and mortar, doesn't it? The, it becomes yeah. the... Yeah. the, the, the the establishment of you as something solid and tangible and you can touch and feel is shines in the book and that's that's where right. that's just picking up on the to the questions from the sidebar um e french cafe and sci-fi um sci-fi funk both said about the book being a great idea and if it would work with a self-published now, I know with some of the people um, we've worked with in the past that the first book gets you noticed. If you've got a second or a third book, then sending the first book as by way of a super business card is a very good, good way to get yourself in their minds and in their memory. But if you haven't got a second book or a third book to give out and it's your only one trick, then what would you do in that, those kind of circumstances? Would you still do it or...? There is that perception. Yeah, I think there is that perception, isn't there? That if you've got one book, yeah. okay, then if you say, but also I've got two other books, 
They think, oh, hang on, the first book was a raging success. She must be good. <laughs> You'd be surprised how many can't. This is why I the second up. book, though. <laughs> first book of mine but i can't easily grab the because they're, they're over the other side of the office uh, the third and fourth book um <laughs> but i think the important thing in here is it, it it's always it's always that if if you don't have a book having a book is better than not having a book if you have two books is better than not having than having one book but i think the really important thing comes back to there's no point if you want to market to a niche having a book that isn't outside that niche. Because if I suddenly wanted to turn up and become known as the motivational speaker, your, your I turned up with... Your was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, the go-to expert, the FT Guide to Business Networking, How to Make Partners and Have a Life, is probably the, the nearest one that would get me to motivational speaking. It would be wrong. And it's, it's important that if you do do that first book, you don't make the mistake that a lot of speakers make, which is they just dash out any old thing. And I know people pour their hearts and souls into it. And it was quite embarrassing that I was reading a book of somebody that actually helps coaches and consultants write their own book. And the mistakes this woman was making, it was horrendous. I was like, you've got a really poor cover, you, you're forever flogging your own stuff. This is a 200-page badly oh written brochure. Don't do it. I then read another book of another very high-profile person in the book publishing world, very, very well-known. You would know her name. I'm not <laughs> going to say the word. And, yes, it was a very well-produced book. But then she was always going, and I did this. And referring back to my other book, it was all I, I, I. And it had sort of forgotten. <laughs> and she managed to lose her impact. She'd forgotten that it's not about I, I, I. It's about the reader. It's about them taking the experiences. So the, the, the important thing is that you, um, when you do do a book, and if it's your first book, you put yourself in the hands of somebody that can lead you through. I, mean, I, I, went, I decided to do it the hard way for my fourth book, self-published, because I wanted the pain. And, and it's like, I now know the pitfalls, but it, I would say if you're not used to what a traditionally published book standard looks like, then put yourself in the hands of somebody that is, because otherwise you could spend 12 to 18 months of your time, five to 10 grand of money, and it could all be a big mm. waste of space. Goodness. So what would you write as your first book then? And would you write a, write a book with the idea that um, you've got another two, three, or would you just go for the first book and pour everything into it and hope that two, three would come out? Or you you start with the end in mind, and I think far too many people don't start with the end in mind when they write a book, whether they're a speaker or not. So it always is you start with the end in mind, and, and most people go, "Oh, I'm going to write a book because it's going to give me a professional speaking career, or it's going to give me." shed loads extra more business and actually that's not specific enough if you're going to write a book you actually really need to do the how is this book going to do this what is this book that going to actually change because it's not enough to put it just on amazon that's not going to make a difference yeah. what's going to make a difference is what you actually do with it and the behavioral change the change that you make i want it so that jk um, rowling says gee i wish i wrote this <laughs> <laughs> So the really big, you know, the really big thing here is is about if if actually you want a door opener, then you don't need to go the traditional published route. You just you don't even need to have a different angle on the subject. What you need is something that you can um, that you can produce that can look good. It doesn't need to have fifty thousand words. It just needs to have enough that you can then send it out to new prospects. You can send it out and use that way. You can use it when you come to a meeting to go, and I've brought you a book. And by the way, it's signed. <laughs> it's very important that, and by the way, it's signed. Um, it makes them feel good. Uh, you know, and you need a physical book from that. If you're wanting something that's maybe more there as a list builder, you need to think about, right, this has got to be there on Kindle. Uh, it's really important this has got to be there on Kindle. Um, I'm going to need to think about how can I join lots of virtual summits and use my book as the platform for that? And how can I make sure that the Kindle book is laced with opportunities for people to download extra resources? 
And so, you know, if you're thinking about becoming a professional speaker, I, I would say that it's good to have a book. It's even better to have a traditionally published book because then you've got external verification of your authority and your credibility. But everybody's got to start somewhere. And actually, if the self-published book is the right place for the right time because you've got to borrow some credibility, then that's the right place to start. But always think about if if you're wanting to be seen as a top-notch credibility, top-notch professional speaker, your book needs to feel professionally produced. So actually, yes, you need to go to somebody that can make sure you have a really decent cover. You need to think about not doing it on Create Space to get the good production values. Um, so it, it is about, and, and as, as Annie Life Prob says, very well sometimes kindle books are like brochures for authors businesses which makes it unreadably Absolutely. irritating and i really share that it's always got to be about what your audience wants which let's go back to the start of this blab this is about choosing and marketing yourself to the niche so you've got to get yourself outside of it it's all got to be about what are the particular problems within that niche because let's take business development <laughs> with business development always the biggest challenge is I don't have enough good opportunities to go and speak to the right type of clients to get the right sort of business through the door. It's always that is the problem. But then when you break it down into specifics, it's actually slightly different challenges. So let's take lawyers. Their biggest challenge is because my chargeable hours target is so high, I don't have the time to do business development. And as far as I'm concerned, I wanted to be a lawyer. I didn't want to be uh, somebody who went out and mm. sold. Whereas you take maybe um, you take maybe take a professional speaker who goes, well, I don't know how to start, and I don't know who my buyers are, and that looks like lovely toast, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and 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 you know, so it's you know the professional speaker isn't so much as um, as you know I have high high chargeable time. It's I don't know who my buyers are. I don't know how to get in front of them. Um, I'm fine if I'm established. So it's, it's, you know, it is a really, it is about knowing those nuances. And when you know those nuances, that's when your words be can become really powerful. I guess we're calling this a breakfast meeting. For <laughs> I'm so sorry. Is that all professional? I don't know, but I'm, I'd love a toast, a piece of toast. Marley, Instead, I'll be in well, solidarity with my team. I'll tell you what, actually. Here's the team. Perfectly it's, honest. It was even, I'm going to be open about this, right? It was even going to be worse than that because you mentioned, is it Cindy, is it? Yes. Sorry, yes. Cindy mentioned earlier that I'd popped on and then popped off again. The reason I popped off again is because I suddenly realised I was lying in bed. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> we talking about how to make a good yeah, In my defence, I was lying in bed still working on the iPad, and that's my excuse, and I'm sticking to it. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Sorry to um, break up the, the flow there, Heather. That was terribly... No problem. That's all right. It was a, it was natural space. It's absolutely <laughs> fine. <laughs> really interesting stuff that you're talking about. You know, I've actually had a realization since Blab came about that I like probably most of you will do a lot of work from home a lot, and um, Blab's almost becoming like a, an office environment in a way. And you mm. you work in here, and you're listening to what people are saying, and then you pop on and say hello and have some social interaction. And you pop off again. Mm. It's almost like the office. That it's a water cooler moment, isn't it? You know, <laughs> you can't. You don't normally have in terms. You know, before this sort of uh, facility, I've just realised it this morning. Really. <laughs> mm. uh, well, Steve. Um, Steve has has blab on a lot <coughs> in the background, and I've seen him on other blabs that as he's working away, he'll suddenly pop up and pop in. And I think that's true with quite a lot of us now that we kind of um, have it going on and then suddenly pop in and end up doing co-hosting, Tim. <laughs> Thank you very yeah, much. Suddenly, suddenly get recruited into <laughs> but a co-hosting room. But I, I do love the it's funny, comments, actually. sorry, because Ed said a little bit further up that um, his publisher actually gave him a lot of control um but because they weren't a target audience for the book um so it created real issues i'd like to bring him in in a bit and just get a bit more of his um take because i think when you're dealing with the niche market you've got to sort of like really have a handle on what you're trying to do and make sure that no one actually sways you from that and if you're jeopardized by publishers that can be a real problem 
Um, yeah. Now, who who are we kind of saying? We say goodbye to no, Tim. We say goodbye um, to Phil. I'm going to just pop off, pop out for a little while. One moment. Oh, okay. Yeah. We're, we're losing Cindy. Oh, okay. um, you're going to be on the side, right? Um, when I was when I when I published while we wait for Ed to come on the line, when I published the FT Guide to Business Networking, and it was in publishing terms, it was a runaway success. My publisher really wanted me to publish something else. And they wanted me to publish a book on personal branding, which wasn't right for me then. And I went to a different publisher to publish the book I wanted to. But over to you, Ed. Welcome <laughs> Thank to you, Black. Andrew. I think we've heard it before on Twitter some time ago um, as yes, well. Yes, we have. Um, I think it's the Bedfordshire on. connection. Um, I used to live in Shefford some time yes. ago, back in a previous life. So that's why. I'm anyway, digressing slightly. Um, so I had um, uh, my first book published in January, um, which I co and thank you very much. Thank you. There's one bucket. Um, Phil, I might just drop you out just because you're echoing all over the place. I think usually it means that someone needs to pop some headphones in if um, if there is um, if there is an echo, um, which I think might be it might be Phil. If there's an echo coming from you, Phil, you might need to pop some headphones. Oh no, he's gone. Okay. Um, that was so, me. Was... That's a... sorry, Phil. <laughs> Nothing personal, Phil. So yes. So thank you, Heather. I had the first book published in January, um, and it was commissioned twelve months previous to that. Um, much of the surprise. Um, a, a delighted surprise, honoured to be asked. Um, and the audience for the book is aimed at businesses who have been trading, any business of any industry who's been trading for about a year, and now they're going through the challenges of, of growth, um, embracing new marketing strategies, or employing people for the first time, or, or um, uh, any form of diversifying, for example. So using the book and the case studies that went with the book, etc., it was aimed at that audience. Now, of course, a publisher isn't that audience. What they know is how to publish a book, and I don't. Mm. And that experience is something that I feel, you know, of course, naturally felt would be invaluable from that perspective. And I have no regrets of writing the book, as I say, quite the opposite. But because they're not the target audience, they were challenging some of the writing that came back to say, is this really the right thing to say? Well, actually, yeah. So for one example, for an existing business looking to maybe grow some, attract some finance, there are many other options often better for a smaller business than the traditional banking route and the publisher was fearful that we were being too harsh on banks which i didn't think we were but again they're not the target audience for it so there was that battle even though they said they gave us that that kind of freedom to start with in the first place what's been a challenge since then is the marketing and the actual lack of marketing support i can't remember who wrote it in the comments box but someone wrote ultimately the one thing that seems very similar between self-publication heather you'll be able to clarify this point between self-publication and having it published is ultimately you still under end up doing the marketing anyway yeah yeah all if you go for a traditional publisher the only thing that you can rely on is that they will they will deliver you a well-produced book uh, and they will list it in amazon uh, everything yeah. else is a bonus um and and it's really true, Ed. I I had that problem of a when when we were writing how to make partners still have a life, which is all about people in partnerships in the professions. So it's it's probably as niche as a mainstream publisher would go. And we had major tussles with them over the title. And we had you know we eventually they left they left us to sort of get on with it. But we still keep having to go back to them when they go. How about this? We go like no, no. No, and, and, and some of it is you have to stick to your guns and some of it is you've got to realise that maybe you've not got the right publisher. Um, and if you are going to publish a niche book, very often the best place to do it is self-published because most publishers, they want, to, they want to sell to the masses. You know, they want to be able to shift 2,000 books. Um, and, you know, so my, my fourth book is Poised for Partnership, which is like how, how um, every senior manager, senior associate can get to partner by building a cast iron personal and business case it's it's probably as niche as you get it's all about the naught to three years between not being partner and being partner and i'm like it's too niche for anybody else and it's great because i've got a list and i can market it myself and, I can, and i'm not giving away 90 percent of my royalties to somebody else um I mean, it, but sorry go for, for i was gonna it, say Cindy. that's that's you've actually made a great point there because again by if you're niching 
um, publishers and even television take you on if you've niched in something where you've either got a big database and this is the mainstream ones they love it because they will take over your database but if you're so generalized and there's just no differentiating between you and somebody else then you're not going to get any of the mainstream publishers yeah any any publisher wants you to have a platform they talk about this author platform thing mm. And what they're really meaning by that is the following. It's what's your social media following? What's your mailing list? And what's your ability to go and speak to large audiences about this? That's what they're really meaning when they're talking about an author platform. And in the years since, so I, my first book came out in 2011, so 2015. And very much there was a shift around 2011, 2012, that you could have the most wonderful idea for a book. But actually, if you didn't have that author platform, then they didn't want to know you. So to answer the question, is 2000 the usual threshold for publishers? Yes. Um, if, you're, if you're trying to do mass market fiction, 2000 is too low. That's non-fiction business book stuff. Um, so to take that back into speaking again, the book very much is a part of that marketing asset. It's part of that setting you apart. It's part of that that tells event managers, as you said, Cindy, that I've got the authority, I've got the depth and I've got the expertise that I can stand up in front of your audience and they're not just going to go, we've heard it all before. <laughs> I am. Um, well, it's interesting you mentioned the they're two always looking for because ultimately that... as well, aren't they? They're looking for that thing that makes you um, different, that, that separates you from the rest of the marketplace. So I think you need to have that, that, that bit of magic that, um, that your publishers wants to be able to sell. It's interesting when you mentioned the point at the, the start of that. I know when the um, so I was I was incredibly fortunate um, uh, that the publisher approached me to to write the proposal for the book. Wow! Um, thanks to social media, actually. They, um, which, as I say, I'm incredibly fortunate um, and honoured to be asked. Um, but much of the proposal that they asked me to write, more than I anticipated, was how I and my co-author who are brought in for the book was going to market the book afterwards which of course you know my assumption and having never experienced this before or even attempted to was that sure of course i'm going to promote it to my uh, my peer group my social networks my physical network etc wasn't quite prepared for how much of the emphasis was going to be on my promotion rather than the publisher and if i may say you know we're talking pearson here which is, is, wow. it, it, yeah, is, a, is you know, as yes. you know, Heather, is a, is a, is a yeah. huge, a huge machine. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, it, it, I, I know that I, when I went to get my foot, like, and actually it's, it's interesting. You say you were incredibly lucky to be approached by his, it. It actually it happens. It, it, it happens quite a lot, but it only happens to people that have, um, really built a brand for themselves, really built authority and have got something to say on the matter. And it's very often something written to say on the matter. Um, you know, I'm sure it might be with some of the YouTubers as well, but it was interesting that I was approached by Pearson. I actually set up the intention that I was going to write a book and then they approached me to write that book. Um, I know another person at Pearson, who, one of my mates was approached to write Double Your Business as a result of some social media activity he did on somebody's blog. The commissioning editor liked his brand because she got the Double Your Sales book, so she wanted the Double Your Business book to go with it. So very often, publishers are looking for a book to go with their list. And if you are out there and you're getting your voice out there and you're writing, um, they may come to you. But you have to have something decent to say to start with before they'll even approach you so well done ed it's not it's it is it's not as unusual as you no, think I'm it sure may it be I'm sure it but it's a massive a massive endorsement of what you're doing is right oh, well that's um there's there's so when i get the knock on the door i'll be going pearson's who <laughs> <laughs> Well, Steve actually did come up with a good point um, in the sidebar. I don't know if you picked up picked up on it, but he said that sometimes they do it as a way to find out your commitment as well to the project, which I guess I've known a few that. few that have been paid up front and uh, or part paid up front and dropped out or just never get around to doing the book. So, 
Yeah, because let's be honest, putting yourself through the pain of writing 50,000 words so it's structured well, it's coherent, there's no spelling mistakes, it looks brilliant, is takes a huge mm -hmm. amount of effort. It can kill you in the process. <laughs> No, it's, um, it's very true. I have to say that that writing experience is one that I both loved and hated in equal measure, it would seem. <laughs> I've, done, yes. I've put together two novels to clients and it's it's hard work. It's really hard work just to even knock out the yeah. artwork for that. Is, is... And, 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 and the, you know, the benefits of, let's take it back to speaking, the benefits are a book might be the missing link to kickstart your speaking career. Because what does a book do in a way that nothing else does? It gets people to approach you because they know that authors will be prepared to turn up to speak for free. Mm. You know, let's be absolutely blatantly honest about it. What do a lot of speakers really struggle with at the start of their speaking career? It's actually getting the opportunities to practice. But a book also crystallizes thought, doesn't it? That once you, you yeah, put absolutely your right, thought Pete. on yeah. paper, um, it, you know, beyond yeah. a blog post, um, it, crisp, it crystallizes that thought across yeah. a broader area of expertise. So. Mm. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, but but it, it, is, it is for people that are thinking about how do I start to break into a niche is a really good way is actually um, think about writing a book for that niche, then use that I'm writing this book to go and interview. So use that borrowed credibility so go and actually go and talk to some of the greats and the goods and the gur gurus. So what Australia, wow, we're talking about that, mm. bothering that credibility. So use that as a license to go and talk. It's brilliant to kick the door down. You'll be amazed how many people go, oh, so you want me to be interviewed for your book? How wonderful. And they'll actually give you the time. Um, and then you've then got the opportunity of you're then getting into that right network. <laughs> Once you've spoken to them, you go and get them to review it that gets you the credibility of their name on their blurb. Um, and it's all, it's a really nice virtuous circle you then get into. Once you've, once you've started writing the book, you then start blogging on it. You then do little transcripts of the interviews that you've actually done. And what you see, what you start to get is this really strong footprint of um, yourself and your expertise and your authority. So that when you get to the point where the book is coming out, um, you can actually, you're lined up with people already because people know you're writing the book and you're lined up to speak. And it's quite important that it is about this real swell towards launch day rather than, right, I finished writing my manuscript, I need to market it. Um, and so, yeah, so thank you, Ed. Thank that you. was really, really useful for your perspective. And I know, folk, I know that uh, Annie Life probably saying that anybody can be an author without even writing a word. Uh, of course they can. They can. They can, um, they can get a ghostwriter, but very much when you're a speaker, and the whole point is that it's your mm -hmm. voice, your take on it. And, yeah. and people and, have got caught out by what the ghostwriter has written, and when they get interviewed. That get really it. only works if you're a pop star, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I don't know. I mean, there's, there has been, there's, um, <laughs> there is a speaker on the circuit. He um, has made a lot of money. The book is his name, and then in a very small is the author and the per is his partner, former business partner, and he actually then admits it's only when he's actually on the stage and you actually question him about his book that he actually says, "Well, I just said the blurb, and it's him who actually wrote it and put the science and all the facts and the figures and the stats that are in it," kind of thing. So it's sort of like um, at least he was kind of honest, but if you're going to put your name to something, then you've got to make sure that you actually know what it is you're putting your name to. But it is coming back down to making sure that it's also within your niche and what you actually be wanting to know, known for, I guess, as well. If you're yeah. looking for a speaker, there's an easy way. Visit iwantaspeaker.com and see. They'll save